Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Photonics Innovation Center seminar series. So today it's our great pleasure and honor to have Professor Weiner here to give a talk to, to many students, especially those who uh, have taken ECE 1450 ultrafast photonics. Professor Weiner needs no introduction. He's the uh, author of the Ultrafast uh, Photonics textbook, which uh, we use for the course. Now, Professor Weiner is the Cypress Family Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue. He earned his uh, Doctor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering in 1984 from MIT. He then joined Belcor, a premier industrial research organization at the time. It's a bit like today's uh, Google research or Apple research. Now he later became a manager of ultrafast optics and optical signal processing research at Belcor. He joined Purdue as a professor in 1992 and has since graduated 43 PhD students. So that's, uh, that's incredible. I don't know how, how he does it. Um, Professor Weiner's research focuses on ultrafast optics with an emphasis on processing of extremely high speed light wave signals and ultra broadband radio frequency signals. He is especially well known for his pioneering work on programmable generation of arbitrary ultra short pulse waveforms, which has found application both in fiber optic networks and, uh, and in ultrafast optical science laboratories around the world. So in fact, in my lab, we have a commercial device called a wave shaper. Uh, and that was based on one of his original ideas. He was awarded the IEEE Photonic Society Quantum Electronics Award for this uh, uh, seminal contribution specifically. His recent research focuses on frequency cone generation from micro resonators and manipulation of broadband entangled photons, which is the topic of talk today. Now, in addition to authoring the ultrafast optics textbook, Professor Weiner has published over 350 journal articles and over 600 conference papers and served a six year term as editor in chief of Optics Express, a journal that we are all very familiar with. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and National Academy of Inventors, a past Department of Defense, uh, a, pa a past Department of Defense National Security Science and Engineering Faculty Fellow, and recipient of numerous awards, including the OSA Wood Prize, uh, which is awarded for an accomplishment measured by uh, its impact one that opens a new area of research or significantly extends an established one. Uh, he's also the recipient of the IEEE Photonic Society Quantum Electronics Award mentioned earlier, and the Purdue University Herbert Newby McCoy Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Natural Sciences. So today we're excited to be here and to learn from his latest research on high dimensional frequency domain quantum photonics. It has generated intense interest in the photonics community, and it is rewarding to see how classical optical techniques developed in past decades can be widely applied in quantum optics. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Weiner. Go ahead. Oh, um, Andy, you are muted. Uh, you're muted. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, good now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, good, Lee. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Thanks for in inviting me, and thanks who are uh, joining to watch. Um, actually, originally I was invited uh, earlier this year and scheduled to come up. I think it was in April, perhaps. <coughs> but of course, uh, there are big events that have affected all of our uh, travel plans, and so. Uh, that wasn't a good time. So I'm glad to be able to uh, connect, even if it's remotely. And uh, it's probably not as a good in-person trip, but I'm sure uh, it's probably warmer, at least in, in Indiana right now. So that's um, for sure. Yeah. So uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of our uh, one of our biggest current 
uh, areas of work, which we call high dimensional frequency bin quantum photonics. Uh, as uh, Lee mentioned, you know, much of my career I've worked in classical ultra fast optics and ultra fast photonics, but uh, uh, really many of the tools that I and others have been interested in over the years in manipulating such uh, short pulse or broadening classical signals, these same uh, tools, as you'll see, uh, give us uh, a lot of interesting capabilities working in the quantum regime when we work with uh, broadband entangled photons. So that's what I'll talk about today. And so uh, you know, I'll start with some uh, general introduction uh, to the quantum area. Uh, I know some of you are working in it and don't need the introduction, uh, but some perhaps are not. Uh, the next section I'll talk uh, particularly what we call frequency bin entanglement, what it is, and a, uh, a big challenge that we were among the groups uh, that learned how to overcome just a few years ago is how to measure what we call frequency bin entanglement. I'll also talk about some work in which if we have a light that's encoded as a superposition of frequency, quantum light as a uh, superposition of frequency states, how can we make uh, gates for such frequency and encoded photons? And then uh, towards the end, uh, you know, one of the uh, things we're interested in the high dimensional part, and I'll talk about two relatively recent works, uh, meaning uh, certainly within the last year, that uh, kind of pushed to higher uh, uh, dimensionality, uh, mixing many frequencies with phase modulators. So uh, some quick uh, acknowledgments. Uh, although I grew up as an experimentalist, I uh, mainly do uh, ex completely do experiments vicariously this day through uh, you know my many enthusiastic uh, group members. And so some of the people who contributed this work, probably not a, a complete list, are three uh, uh, students who graduated within the last um, two years or so: Fulani uh, Mani, uh, Jose Jaramillo, and Ogago Odeli. Some current students, actually current students, Peach Lu and Mohammed uh, Al-Sheikh have just appended their theses. And so they're bumping my PhD list from 43, actually to 45 is now the current number. And together with some students who will continue the group, uh, Suparna Naveen, uh, Alex Moore, and uh, some uh, faculty uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, also, as you'll see in part of this work, <coughs> we have a very robust collaboration with colleagues at Oak Ridge National Labs. Currently, uh, Joe Lukens, actually a former Purdue student from some years ago, is, is the principal contact there. So some of this work is a close a collaboration with our friends at Oak Ridge. And we also do some related work or have recently with the Army Research Labs. So uh, moving on to the introduction, uh, you know, I think we all know that in the uh, classical world, we like to use uh, digital uh, binary encoding. So zeros and ones, or if we think of a coin, we flip a coin, we get a zero, we get, or we get a one. We uh, never talk about getting uh, them simultaneously. But in the quantum mechanical regime, we have uh, uh, qubits, uh, which are two-level systems in which the information or the state can exist and does exist as a superposition of uh, zeros or ones. Uh, for the coins, it would be a superposition of heads and tails. The phasing is also important, and so it could be a plus or minus, or in fact, any other complex uh, you know, number for a phase. And so, uh, you know, there's intrinsic randomness in measurement. Once we make a measurement, we can measure a head or measure a tail, but it's, uh, it's random and we have interference phenomena because we have these superposition states. Now, we're interested in high dimensionality, which means not just two levels, but many levels. Classically, instead of a coin, we could think of a six-sided dice, or we could think of modern light wave or wireless communications, where they're generally a multi-level modulation with uh, more than uh, two levels uh, per symbol. So you can encode more information for classical uh, symbol, as shown here, for these classical quantum constellations. In the classical, in the quantum regime, we talk about qubits, d for dimensionality, uh, greater than two. And so we can uh, now write as a superposition, not just of two states, but of uh, D uh, different states. And this gives a potential for encoding of multiple qubits worth of information uh, per uh, particle. So, um, you know, quantum entanglement is also a big thing and one of the key resources for essentially any type of quantum information. 
And so entanglement, we talk about, let's imagine in a two-dimensional system, we have two coins. Uh, maybe we give them to, uh, one to Alice, uh, one to Bob. In the uh, classical regime, they can each flip their coin, each get heads or tails. Their results are uh, independent and uncorrelated. In the classical regime, we can have entangled states where we might, for example, have a wave function with superposition of Alice and Bob both having a head or both having a uh, tail. So uh, uh, if we make a measurement, either they both get heads or both have tails. So these strong correlations, uh, these correlations can uh, occur at a uh, distance. So we say they're non-local. And a phase is a very important set of a plus. We could have a minus or an e to the i phi term. And so we get uh, uh, quantum interference between two entangled photons, for example. And we'll be interested in not only two-dimensional entanglement, but uh, higher dimensionality. And so uh, thinking of the, uh, uh, the, the two dice example showing such kind of strong phase-dependent correlations. So as probably everyone is familiar, there's been a huge amount of work encoding quantum information in photons. Uh, there's actually many different interesting choices. Uh, what I illustrate here you know, are some uh, pictures taken from this uh, uh, fairly comprehensive review article just from about two years ago. So the most common uh, perhaps is to quantum states in which polarization is a binary degree of freedom, so qubits, so we have polarization qubits. Uh, one can have path encoding. This has become very popular. If we're looking at so-called large-scale uh, silicon photonic uh, quantum uh, uh, circuits, so where our light can exist as a superposition of many different spatial modes and spatial waveguides. Uh, time band encoding, sort of quantum analogies to maybe time multiplexing and classical optics exist, uh, or orbital angular momentum has seen a, a great deal of uh, interest. And not all of these, but uh, most of these, except for polarization, can admit uh, uh, dimensionality is beyond two. Uh, in general, photons, as they're in classical, are great for communications, but because they don't interact uh, strongly, it's hard to make a gates, or it's hard to make two photon gates. That's a challenge. And the lack of deterministic photon sources is a, uh, a challenge. But uh, what we're looking at is, if we look at this review, it really doesn't mention optical, the optical frequency degree of freedom. And that's going to be the one that we're interested in. Uh, the primary difficulty has been that if you have light at different frequencies, uh, tens of gigahertz apart or more, it's hard to get stable interference. We get time varying signals, they're very fast. There's no way to kind of uh, uh, measure them. So it's been difficult to sort of mix frequencies and measure the superposition states. What this will talk will be about in part is uh, uh, getting beyond that, allowing us to work with the frequency degree of freedom for quantum information in photons. And so why do we care about frequency? Well, one is because it's there. Two, because people like me have uh, made a, a career out of enjoying manipulating uh, super business of frequency in the classical ultra-fast optics regime. But from uh, the application's point of view, uh, I think quantum networking is a uh, you know, very important reason we're going to need to put quantum light over uh, fibers to interconnect remote quantum resources. So we know that frequencies are robust and uh, incredibly successful for transmission over fibers, you know, the classical regime and WDM. We can certainly have a potential for high dimensionality or more information per photon. Uh, I think routing is very important. Uh, we can have gratings or other devices that separate light based on frequency, and at least in principle, in a lossless way, that's very useful. A parallel processing, uh, at least part of the work will be used with chip scale microresonator sources. <coughs> and so going forward, uh, potential to move towards you know, more complete integration. Uh, we're only kind of touching the bottom of it now, but it is definitely a goal. And although I don't think I'll get into it here, there's interesting ways you can kind of mix degrees of freedom, frequency of time, the frequency of time, uh, polar polarization. <coughs> Maybe a, a key point I'd like to make here is that uh, in classical WDM, you can say frequency is used for channel delineation. You have uh, different frequencies or different wavelengths, those are different data channels. Uh, in the quantum regime, there's some use, certainly some useful ways you can use that concept, but we would be like to be able to uh, develop the capability to go beyond that and encode quantum information uh, 
that's encoded and entangled uh, coherently across different frequency slices. So that's more like the analogy of shaping ultrafast pulses. So some background, uh, you know, Lee mentioned already my kind of work in pulse shapers. Uh, these are certainly going to be one of the tools that we use here. And uh, for those who aren't familiar, the basic idea uh, was that if you come in with a short pulse, it's too fast to really uh, reshape with direct electronic modulation, but uh, there's many frequencies. So 100 femtosecond pulse will have a border 10 terahertz in bandwidth. We can separate out the different frequencies or colors using a grading and a lens. So like a spectrometer, focus different frequencies, only two of which are shown here, uh, down to kind of a, a pencil where those frequencies are separated by putting in a spatially patterned object or an electronically controllable modulator array to manipulate amplitude and phase on a frequency by frequency basis. After the light is recombined, the uh, input pulse is transformed, really Fourier transformed into a new uh, waveform that uh, can be uh, very well controlled. And it really is uh, the new output waveform is uh, really the inverse Fourier transform of the spatial pattern transferred uh, here onto the complex spectrum. These are just sort of two examples of early uh, uh, waveforms uh, with uh, femtosecond scale features that we, we thought were kind of cool, and I, and I still do. So there's many applications to this. Uh, uh, offshoots of this have developed in, into wavelength selecting switches using lightweight network. Uh, we're active in broadband radio frequency photonics, and in here in, uh, these are simply programmable uh, arbitrary amplitude and phase filters used for manipulating quantum states. Some pictures of an early uh, uh, setup from my lab where we first started going in and out of uh, fibers to the full free space pulse shapers. And here's a, a commercial implementation, the uh, a wave shaper that Lee uh, uh, referred to from the Finisar Corporation. Uh, we, use, uh, we have several of these that we use in these experiments. Typical parameters are uh, C-band coverage, five terahertz, uh, controllable amplitude and phase with 10 gigahertz resolution, so of order 500 resolvable control elements, uh, relatively a uh, large degree of control on these uh, broadband spectra. And one classical uh, example, uh, then we'll go on to all the quantum work, but, but this one I, you know, I think is kind of a useful segue. Here uh, we are interested in uh, uh, using these pulse shapers as tools for dispersion compensation. So the idea is they have a short input pulse, it goes to a single mode fiber, it spreads out. Uh, in our case, these are going to be sort of half picosecond pulses. Uh, at the time we started doing this, the late 90s, these might be uh, for light wave communications, 10 gigabit per second on off king uh, trains. You get spreading there as well, though uh, not nearly as large. And the industry was developing dispersion compensating fibers which would have the opposite sign of dispersion of standard fiber so that you could cancel these distortions. In our group, we were interested in sort of probing the short pulse you know, limits, and we chose about half a picosecond. And so what happens with the right length of dispersion compensating fiber, the pulse gets mostly compressed, but not completely, because there'll still be some phase mismatch uh, in the spectral phase. And so with the pulse shape, we program where you fine tune that and get full compression. The key relationship is that if you have spectral phase psi of omega, that's related to dispersion or frequency dependent delay uh, through a frequency derivative. And so, for example, if you have linear phase and you can get constant delay, um, you might see some examples of that going forward. And you get frequency dependent delays or pulse spreading with polynomial phase. So here we come in with about a half a picosecond input. We're going through a relatively short fiber here, about three kilometers. It spreads out about 300, 300 times, not shown here, where the dispersion compensating fiber comes back almost to the original pulse, not quite. And you can see this asymmetric distortion that's mainly due to cubic spectral phase. That's a higher order phase term. So with our pulse shape, we apply this phase versus pixel uh, pattern, which is cubic, or phase versus frequency. It's chosen just right to sort of correct this and give us undistorted uh, propagation. So there's certainly been more aggressive experiments like this, but these are this type of uh, space control. Uh, later on, we're going to want to use in the quantum domain. So let's talk about frequency band uh, entanglement. So uh, the photons we're going to generate are through two different ways. The one of these is the uh, very well-known 
a spontaneous parametric down conversion technique. We send a single frequency laser into a, uh, in our case, a TIP1 waveguide. And in any parametric down conversion, if your pump is at frequency two omega naught with some weak probability in the second order nonlinear uh, medium, uh, the photon can split into two photons with uh, which we call signal and idler. Uh, the uh, individual photon energies are uh, random within some phase matching bandwidth, which can be about five terahertz in our experiments, but the sum of the two frequencies have to be the same so uh, that you have energy conservation. We can write this as a current superposition of photons that are upshifted by this cap omega and downshifted with some phase matching function. And uh, so if we look at this, the signal and either frequencies are random with about five terahertz, but there's, there's a tight frequency and a correlation. Turns out uh, there's a Fourier uh, transform relationship going back to time. And so uh, the individual photons are emitted only occasionally. Uh, but when they are emitted, both the signal and idler are emitted at the same time. And that correlation, that uh, timing correlation is tight within one over the uh, total bandwidth. So this could be 100 femtoseconds type uh, timing correlations. So uh, we've also uh, been doing work uh, in integrated photo photonic sources. So these would be uh, ring resonators, in our case, in silicon nitride. Similar story, you come with a single frequency. Uh, you get out many frequency pairs. Uh, now they're, they're now it's discrete because you have the uh, discrete resonator modes. And uh, the main difference is now this is a third order process. So two photons pool their energy to give you a signal and idler that are randomly distributed across these different modes with tight timing correlations, uh, with tight uh, frequency and uh, correlations. Okay, and so this is discrete. You know, in these uh, continuous SVDC, Usually we put in spectral filters. We can do this with a, a programmable pulse shaper or an etalon to convert this into sort of a discrete uh, version. We'll call those frequency bands. So uh, some of the early experiments that we did with these micro rings helped illustrate the concepts. Uh, originally it was for a small micro ring. It had longitudinal modes about 400 gigahertz away. If we uh, pump it, uh, here's a strong pump. Uh, we attenuate that in this trace in series, a series of weak signal and idler uh, bins. These are so spontaneous Fourier mixing. If we now use a pulse shaper to programmably route the, the short wavelength side of the spectrum of signal to one single photon detector, the large wavelength to the other, and do this on a bin by bin basis, and look for coincidences between the two photon, the single photon detectors, we can build up what's called a joint spectral intensity. We look at it here, and as, as we look at the different frequency modes, we see strong diagonal correlations. <coughs> you know, these peaks, for example, are the second signal and idler from the center, third signal and idler. Here's the second signal and third idler. Essentially, we get nothing. And so this is really kind of proof of the anti-correlation. This was another device that was uh, about eight times larger, 50 gigahertz FSR, and here we could see uh, there's actually more, but we measured out to about 40 bins. And again, strong diagonal. So this is a potential for very uh, high dimensional uh, entanglement that we're interested in. Okay, however, uh, we're not really looking at entanglement yet. We're looking at frequency correlations. Going back to dispersion, we kind of did dispersion experiments with these entangled photons in the single nit silicon nitride microring resonator. Again, we take half the spectrum uh, we cut it up, we route it to two different detectors, and we uh, do various experiments with or without uh, fiber brag, true fiber brag ratings that give dispersion. And we arrange these so they have opposite sides of dispersion. So if we uh, just look at four frequency bins for the signal and idler without these dispersive elements, we have a single peak. All four of those uh, contribute to the same you know, coincidence peaks. If we put the chirp fiber vibrating in one arm only, we disperse the signal, we uh, give differential delay to different photon pairs, and we get coincidences at different delays. So this is kind of a frequency of a delay mapping for visualizing the biphoton uh, spectrum. These peaks are uh, in agreement with the joint spectral intensity. So we can put the chirp fiber vibrating in the other arm, take away the first one, same thing, but they're spread in a different order. 
And finally, if we compensate, put a same dispersion of opposite signs in gold, we get a single peak back. So this is called non-local dispersion compensation. It's a well-known uh, phenomenon, I'd say time frequency quantum optics. And uh, this is different than the classical regime where you have to put all of the dispersion dispersion elements in a single link to get dispersion compensation. Here we get compensation uh, essentially by doing, looking at the correlations between dispersion and different arms. So it's kind of an interesting quantum mechanical phenomenon. But I'll caution you also, uh, we're not getting at entanglement uh, here uh, yet. This is just showing frequency correlations. Another uh, experiment I'd like to touch on, this is from the group of Rupert Orson in Austria. And they did some very nice work where they're looking at polarization entangled photons, but over a broadband uh, emission. And what they do using a you know, series of uh, many WDM filters, fixed filters, they can route uh, frequency correlated slices to different uh, users. And so they can use different frequency slices corresponding to different parts of the numbers of the ITU grid to sort of route samples of the spectrum to different users and do it in such a way that uh, there's always correlated uh, signals to between each user pair. So it's a way of simultaneously uh, trying to distribute entanglement to uh, mutual entanglement to all the different users in the uh, network. Uh, and uh, so this is based on polarization entanglement but using wavelength is really a, a channel delineator, as I mentioned before. So I think it's interesting. We're doing some work like this too, using programmable wavelength selective switches to do this. But uh, for the point of this talk, <coughs> I want to point out again that this is actually not using frequency bin entanglement at all or two photon coherence in the, in the frequency bin sense. Uh, it's really using as a resource for a polarization entanglement distribution. Okay, so uh, that really sets up the question, uh, how do we know if we have frequency bin entanglement? And so uh, the idea here is, this is a notional view of my bipotent frequency comb. These black lines, solid lines, are the frequency correlations. And what we really need is a wave function where we have coherent phase across these different photon pairs. Okay, and so that's this alpha sub k, uh, the question, it should have complex amplitude, a magnitude and phase, and the phase has to be stable or coherent in terms of the two photon wave function. So that's what these dashed lines are. Uh, the question is, you know, is it coherent? From the time to, from the delay perspective, we can look at the time correlation functions. Uh, if there's a coherent phase, and let's say the phase is flat, you get a time correlation function with a strong modulation. <coughs> these would be picosecond scale. Uh, with tens of picosecond scale uh, modulation and time correlation function, which is unfortunately too fast to measure with almost uh, all single photon detectors. Since we have uh, detectors that are slower, have higher jitter, we kind of average over this, uh, and we just get this envelope is the same that we would have without any phase coherence. And so unfortunately, because we don't have single uh, picosecond resolution detectors, uh, you can't tell whether you have this bi-photon phase coherence. Okay, so the question is how to uh, measure that. So uh, here we use phase modulators. I think this audience is probably familiar with them, but we just use telco phase modulators, depending how strong we drive them. Starting from a single frequency, as we drive harder and harder with a sinusoid, we make an increasing number of sidebands in this vessel function type of way. And that's gonna allow us to mix up frequencies and be the basis. Uh, for some two-photon correlation experiments. And maybe I, I don't have time to really get into it, but I'll point to some, uh, some of the uh, very cool work by the Steve Harris group about 10 years ago that used this to do sort of a uh, analog of the nonline local dispersion compensation through a frequency analog uh, by putting phase modulators in, in signal and idler uh, photons. But you know, we'll go on and see how we use this for proving entanglement. So the idea is we take our biphoton frequency comb. Um, what we can do is use a, a first pole shaper to just select some number of bins that we want, typically two or three signals, two or three idlers. <coughs> We're going to phase modulate it. We're going to drive in with RF frequency that's chosen. 
to equal, equal either line spacing or these experiments, half the line spacing also works. So they'll make these new green sidebands that are shown here that didn't exist before. And these uh, sidebands will be the, uh, have sort of multiple parents. Their nearest neighbor lines, we modulate harder, we can have more multiple lines contributing. If we look at the coincidence, if we use a second pulse shaper, say to grab this new sideband and the frequency matched other new sideband, send them to a different single photon detector and look at coincidences, turns out this is a phase dependent process, this quantum interference. And if we play with the initial phase on this uh, starting by photon frequency cone with the first pulse shaper, we can manipulate the interference and, uh, and demonstrate the phase coherence that's the hallmark of entanglement. So we do that. Here's uh, first using a, uh, a parametric down conversion spectrum. We carve with a pulse shaper into a series of bins spaced by 36 gigahertz and 12 gigahertz spacing. If we pick two signals and two idlers, we get curves like this as we play with what they call it a phase parameter that we use in uh, manipulating the initial state. Okay, so with zero phase, we get a uh, strong coincidences. Uh, but if I change the phase, I can get almost complete destructive interference. And this is again in two proton interference. This is with the first and second signal angular bins. Here's the second and third. And, and uh, so that works. We've also gone up to three dimensions. We have three signals and three idlers. The curves uh, sharpen, sort of like uh, Moebach laser pulses would sharpen with more coherent, evenly spaced frequencies. And this shows three dimensional entanglement. And uh, to these were some of our original measurements since then we've got better detectors the so-called s and svds and so we, we certainly have better sort of let's say signal to noise uh now we can do very similar things with the micro ring resonators so here's a 50 gigahertz micro ring resonator here the line widths are much narrower about 100 megahertz <coughs> and here's looking at two-dimensional data the sixth and the seventh bin or the seventh, fifth and the sixth <coughs> Excuse me. And again, we have sufficiently good uh, two photon interference. We can prove entanglement. Um, and we've gone up to 3D as well. Here I'd like to mention a work that happened independently around the same time, uh, published a little bit earlier by the group from Roberto Morandati at INRS, uh, who essentially, he and his colleagues uh, came up with a very similar idea uh, in parallel around the same time. So. Uh, you know, they certainly at least equally uh, helped kick off uh, some of this, this work, uh, some, some beautiful work out of, of their organization. Um, back to some of the things at Purdue, you can also measure the dispersion th this way. And so, for example, uh, this is the SPDC work, but if, for example, we do two-dimensional entanglement me uh, measurements, uh, we measure the screen one, we record some data, we do it again with, uh, whoops, with a different frequency sets of pair, a different frequency pair, and we have quadratic phase from dispersion. If we look at a particular measurement, we get these curves that are actually shifted from the origin, and that gives us information about the biphoton phase, uh, which will vary depending on which bin pair. We can also look at the coincidence for uh, versus frequency for fixed phase at the input, and we get these spectral uh, interference that's similar in spirit to spectral interferometry and ultrafast optics. From both of those, we can uh, pull out some data and get the value of the dispersion, which agrees to about 1% within the specified value. And so it's kind of a very low light level way to measure dispersion. Uh, do we in the field really need this? Uh, probably not. Classical instruments are very good. But it uh, you know, does show that we understand in a great deal how these uh, wave functions evolve uh, during fiber propagation. So uh, let me go on now to uh, my next topic, which is uh, how to manipulate frequency encoded photons, or how do we make uh, uh, gates? And this will be some work uh, in close collaboration with the colleagues at Oak Ridge Labs, and is uh, uh, involving experiments that uh, follow a their original proposal of something called a quantum frequency processor. And uh, so the idea in terms of components are the same components. Uh, phase modulator, pulse shaper, phase modulator. The uh, difference is in the entanglement measurements, we had pulse shaper, phase modulator, pulse shaper. You know, here it's, uh, it's, it's sort of flipped. But the idea is suppose we have an input quantum state that's uh, encoded, this is the frequency axis, 
and this can be two or more uh, frequencies. Most of the experiments are two or three frequencies at this point. A phase modulator will mix frequencies, but uh, it doesn't do it. It doesn't just keep the two uh, frequencies. If you modulate further and further, you kind of spread out in frequency space. That would be undesirable in a quantum context because if you have a two-dimensional input, you're uh, scattering light out of your computational space, and that's a loss. So, uh, but so you can do phase modulators for mixing, and then the uh, really uh, one of the insights in this proposal is that if you have a second phase modulator, and in between you use a pulse shaper to manipulate phases, you can design uh, waveforms, that is drive signals to the modulators, phase settings to the pulse shaper, that uh, with very uh, good results, bring you back to sort of two frequencies only, so you maintain your photons in the computational space with a desired transformation in terms of the quantum state. You can think of these as is involving matrices or diagonal, and diagonal phase and time and frequency and in time again. So uh, to give a little bit of an analogy, uh, you know, this is some of the beautiful work on large scale uh, quantum silicon photonics. Uh, down at the bottom, this is work out of the Bristol group. But the idea is the recipe for decomposing matrices or, you know, single photon gates is quite different. And it's really a concatenation of uh, Interferometers, let's say mox enders, and uh, external phase shifters. So if you have uh, interferometers and phase shifters that you then interconnect in different ways, uh, you can make uh, you know, represent different uh, transformation matrices. You, you get a quadratic scaling of how many building blocks you need uh, based on the dimensionality uh, uh, n. And let's see, let's uh, go th this way. Going back here, this is going to be very different. We're going to uh, simply have a phase modulator, pulse shaper phase modulator. In some cases, you might concatenate more, but we'll concentrate on just these three. And uh, uh, by having more complex control signals uh, to these three, to the same physical resources, you can build up higher dimensionalities. So it's a different, that is an interesting approach to making these single photon gates. So some examples. The first one, which was our uh, first uh, uh, Purdue Oak Ridge uh, joint uh, publication in this area, was for making essentially a beam splitter for frequencies. So you can call this a Hadamard gate or a 2D discrete Fourier transform. If we have a two frequency input, uh, we'd like this transformation matrix. And so it turns out uh, one can design uh, control waveforms involving a single RF harmonic that is adjusted to equal the frequency bin spacing that uh, makes this gate with very high fidelity, four nines, and actually then higher since, and about uh, approaching 98% success probability. So if we come with this blue uh, single frequency input, we get these two equal out, uh, red output on the output. And if we come in the blue as a superposition state, we have the right phase and we can collapse into a single frequency uh, on either side, okay? Which is just what a beam splitter does. You might be able to see a little peak here, for example. There's a little bit of light scattered to other frequencies that's unwanted, but that's kind of the, the 2% of, of lack of full success probability. And we, I talked a little bit about parallel processing. So we could do this for uh, entangled photons, a uh, single photon that's, entang uh, that's a superposition of two frequencies, the corresponding idlers, idlers, so that's four frequencies in total. We can put these Hadamard gates selectively on one uh, or zero or both. So if we put no Hadamard gates on, we start with this um, particular diagonal correlation in frequencies. We put a Hadamard gate on only one arm or only the other arm, uh, or signal and idler, we kind of maximally spread into the two by two space. But if we uh, put Hadamards on both, we maintain strong correlations, but we can actually uh, flip the uh, ordering of the uh, correlations if you go from anti-correlated to uh, uh, correlated. So this kind of work certainly can happen with polarization, you know, or spatial uh, superposition. The first type of demonstration that could be done in uh, frequency as well. We've gone on. To, uh, I mentioned uh, three-dimensional. So in our original uh, uh, paper, we also try to do a 3D beam splitter version or frequency tritter, or three-dimensional discrete Fourier transform. <coughs> Here's the same hardware, 
So we're able to drive the phase modulators with two RF harmonics. The optimization code chooses the waveform of the pulse shaper settings. We can do analogous things. So a single frequency in, any of these single frequency ends gives you a, a trip with the frequencies out. If you do the superposition state with the proper phase settings, you can do experiments where you collapse into any of these uh, frequencies. So again, there's high fidelity, good success probability. Recently, uh, this is, I think, uh, we just submitted to Clio, but we again did this parallel processing idea where we could do these uh, 3D DFTs independently on the signal and the idler for an entangled photon pair. <coughs> Here, instead of, uh, we can, uh, there's sort of more choices. So we can look at correlations where we uh, don't do anything to either photon or where we, you know, choose which of the two different other possibilities that we can do. And what you can see basically is uh, we have more kind of mutually unbiased uh, bases. Um, I'm probably using the wrong word here. Let me scratch that. But in any case, we can uh, do different transformations of the correlations. These are kind of all mutually exclusive in where the peaks are uh, in this higher dimensional uh, case. Just one other thing I'll mention, in addition to trying to go to higher dimensions, and, and we think there's possibilities of going quite a bit higher. <coughs> you can also ask, well, can we do more than DFT gates? DFT gates uh, are very useful, but if you ever want to do something that's computationally uh, complete, you need a general uh, single photon gates. Okay, and so uh, instead of not only Hadamard gates, you need X gates, for example. See illustrated, if we start at the North Pole, we can look for, well, wherever. Uh, Hadamard might be going from the North Pole down to the equator. Uh, next day, we're going from the North Pole down to the South Pole. And, and how does that work? So we've looked at that and published on that uh, earlier this year. And the bottom line is if uh, you have the three elements and one RF tone, it gets harder as you go to harder, larger rotation angles. So we can still do, we're constraining, I think, four nines in fidelity, but you can only get to about 75% success probability. So theoretically, we studied if we add a single RF harmonic, and now we can uh, drive the success probability much higher. And if we imagine more resources, which we haven't done yet, with adding another phase modulating pulse shaper, you know, essentially we can get very high success probability over the full uh, angles. <coughs> and to verify this, looking at one RF tone experiments, we've uh, done a series of these single photon gates where we start at the North Pole and have different rotation angles uh, and move along the, uh, I guess, lines of latitude uh, as well, and uh, explore you know, how well we can do as a function of angle. And these just show some results. If we look at uh, the targets, which are the dots, versus a series of measurements, we come very close and, and can do fidelity sort of above 0.99 in most, uh, most cases. So again, just showing that there's a number of things we've done here, and this just gives you some sense. Okay, so I think I've just about enough time. I'm going to hit a little bit now on pushing a higher uh, dimensionality. We've gotten up to three dimensions in the uh, discussion so far. But let's go up to sort of uh, nine or ten. Okay, and so uh, the first thing we'll do is something called a frequency quantum walk. Uh, quantum walks have been a, a popular thing to do in, in the quantum optics regime, as well as other areas of kind of quantum science. But in optics, for example, uh, people have done things like uh, send it light into uh, an input of an interferometer circuit or to a series of coupled uh, uh, waveguides. And there's uh, interesting distinctions between what would happen classically. Classically, you might flip a coin and it tells you to go left or right with equal probability. And it uh, uh, tends that you tend to get a uh, diffusive transport. So you get some distribution uh, clustered in the center and maybe it eventually becomes a Gaussian. Uh, in uh, quantum mechanics or really with wave transport, uh, you can get something very different. It, uh, uh, and you can, for example, spread what's called ballistically. So you kind of uh, get a distribution that is uh, kind of maximally pushed out. So that's uh, uh, quite different. We're going to be looking at multi-photon walks in front with entangled photons. Now, some of this has certainly been done as uh, well, but the entanglement will lead to interesting behavior. And in particular, what I'll show here 
is by pulse shaping at the input how we can essentially coherently control some aspects of the quantum walk behavior. Okay, so again, we're going to use a phase modulator. If we drive this uh, hard, we can uh, mix together about uh, 20 frequency modes with a single uh, a phase modulator. And so this will, we'll start exploring um, what happens as we mix larger uh, number of modes simultaneously. So our experiments, uh, parametric gown conversion, we uh, pulse shape into a series of bins. We can apply a spectral phase here as well. We're going back to our phase modulator, we just drive it harder now. A uh, second pulse shaper to frequency D mux. And uh, if we look at the joint spectral intensity by looking at coincidence counts as a function of signal and idler uh, frequency setting. So it's a lot like our entanglement measurements, only uh, exploring higher dimensionality. This is the uh, joint spectral intensity of the state that we uh, start up, a nice strong frequency and a correlation, and we happen to sort of block out the central one. If we uh, just take the as is generated uh, entangled state and phase modulate it hard, it spreads out, and I call this diagonal direction. This is direction opposite to the original correlations. What's happening, and when we get a uh, click out here, it means the signal and the idler have both gained energy or both lost energy. So there's some common mode walking in the same direction in, in frequency space. Uh, it's kind of random, but they both tend to go up or both tend to go down in frequency. And if you look at how much this thing spreads for the uh, single photon case versus the two photon case, we call this a ballistic versus enhanced ballistic transport. Uh, the standard deviation of the spread goes at about twice the rate for two photons than for one. Now, the interesting thing is we can control this if we uh, uh, change the phase of the input by photon state. And so, in particular, uh, the one I just showed you has a flat phase or the really as generated phase. But with our pulse shapers, we can introduce alternating pi phase shifts in the by photon phase. So that might mean we put matching pi over two for both the matching frequencies and, and, and signals every other time. Uh, and what you can see is that after we do the same strength of phase modulation, uh, we have a dramatic difference in joint spectral intensity. Essentially, it doesn't spread off the line anymore. It broadens a little bit along this line. But uh, now the signal and the idler are, if we look at the sum of them, aren't gaining energy or aren't losing energy. They keep the same uh, energy. And if we do this, if we look at this versus how strong we modulate uh, for this original, we call it enhanced ballistic transport. It just spreads and spreads and spreads. If we look at this uh, pi phase shift case, it hardly spreads at all. Okay. And so it's interesting that you can have this kind of coherent control over this phenomena. And also, we can get some insight thinking from the time domain. So it turns out. As I mentioned briefly earlier, there's a Fourier transform relationship between the biphoton state in the frequency domain and the time correlation function between the photons in the time domain. So if we look at our original state, uh, the time correlation function should be uh, sharp. Signal and photon should be simultaneously as we grow the number of dimensions in this sort of simulation from 8 to 64. It gets, the correlation gets very tight. But the point is uh, they both see the same phase modulation and uh, they can arrive randomly, but if they arrive here, they're both gonna be shifted up in frequency. If they arrive here at a different place with respect to the RF, uh, they'll be shifted down and that'll be in common mode. And, and so that really works when you have a tight correlation and high dimensional entanglement. On the other hand, if we put in these alternate pi phase shifts, we can predict the time correlation function is shifted and say if the signal photon were here, the idler photons would be half a period away. Now the signal photon can be anywhere, but the idler photon will always be half a period away. And because the phase modulation will have a different slope, when one gets shifted up in frequency, the other gets shifted down, the total is, is the same. And so uh, so one I'll mention we can have some intuition to why this happens. I mean, you know why we have these coherent control over the type of spreading and the quantum walk. Um, you know, you know, simply here, I like it because it points out a tight connection of the frequency and time domain views of the biphotons, and that uh, you know, without high dimensionality, this wouldn't, this effect wouldn't be nearly as uh, as strong. So this doesn't prove high dimensional in any quantitative way at this point, but certainly draws upon it and, and suggests that in fact 
the entanglement dimensionality is, is much beyond the two or three that we formally proved. So the uh, last thing that I'll uh, touch on quickly uh, is quantum delay metrology at the single picosecond level. This also uh, kind of highlights these uh, frequency time inter interchange and uh, higher dimensionality. So the idea here is that single photon detectors by and large have limited time resolution. So in our lab, uh, originally we're using in-gas single photon detectors with about 350 picoseconds uh, gener general limited resolution. Now we have a pair of SNSPDs that do about 100 picoseconds. And there are faster ones, but uh, generally uh, they're still relatively slow if you want a picosecond or faster resolution. So in experiments a few years ago, we had an idea that maybe we could use modulators to do a bit better. These at that time were intensity modulators. And the idea is that we could uh, send our signal and uh, I boot pair to a pair of modulators. These are telecom modulators. Uh, so these could give you tens of picoseconds type of gates. Here ours were fairly slow, but they were like 70 picosecond gates. <coughs> and by changing the delay with respect to drive the modulators, you can slide a gate on a signal and idler across each other and get some better time resolution. What we're able to do is take a, this red curve, which was the native time resolution, about 350 picoseconds, and get uh, timing measurements about five times better, uh, about 70 uh, picoseconds. So we got some improvement, but it's really modest, and the intensity modules are clearly throwing away uh, valuable quantum photons. So a more recent idea was to do this with phase modulators. And this is sort of similar to the ideas in our frequency entanglement measurements. And it turns out we're going to uh, phase modulate our signal and idler, but look, it changed the relative delay, similar to what happened to quantum walk. <coughs> and then when we look at the frequency correlations, uh, we're gonna see a delay uh, signature. Okay, we'll see that this, uh, this um, works. Okay, and there's a number of possible applications. You know, we haven't really got very far into this, but uh, uh, you know, high resolution in time could give you good range resolution for some kind of LIDAR type of experiment. Uh, there's some cases where you want much good timing resolution to resolve delay for some types of uh, high dimensional PKD. And uh, we're particularly interested in the possibility of timing acquisition or synchronization at the picosecond scale for quantum networking applications. So going on to just two or three slides to finish off on the experiments. <coughs> and our first experiment was based on local detection, meaning we had to bring the signal and idler together. But uh, so the main thing is after we generate the biphotons, we make frequency bands, we can play with phase if we want. We uh, separate signal and idler. We just put a delay line in the, one of the arms. We bring the signal and idler back together uh, we phase modulate them with the same phase modulator. We uh, demultiplex frequencies in particular. Uh, we grab a particular matching signal idler frequencies. Those are like the greed sidebands that I talked about when we discussed the entanglement measurement. And uh, we look at counts. And so the schematic is here we're going to have nine signal frequencies, nine idlers. We can mix them all with a single phase modulator. We're going to grab just the sort of fifth bin of the signal and the idler and look at those coincidence counts versus delay. And here's what we get. So this was reported uh, this year at Clio, um, showing data over a single RF modulation period, which is 25 gigahertz modulation here, we get a 3.7 picosecond peak. So it's, it's very uh, delay, sensitive delay. It's a good indicator of delay. You can see very fine scale uh, delay variations, degrees with theory, and we can do this with a physical delay line or simply by programming linear phase on a pulse shaper, which gives us delay as well. It's also interesting to note, if you look over a larger time scale, this repeats at the RF modulation frequency. We believe this will repeat on state flat uh, kind of a very long time, just limited by the coherence of your pump laser. And so uh, on the one hand, this could be very useful because you could have a, we've done experiments with a microsecond delay offset between signal and idler, and you still get peaks and measure very fine delay changes. Uh, but it does mean uh, that you, you need absolute time separation 
uh, you probably need to supplement this with some other uh, techniques to disambiguate you know, which range you're in. So this is something that's well known in white light interferometry, for example. And so uh, finally, you know, what's really interesting here is that was with local detection. You can measure delay locally where the two photons come together with Hongo Mando, for example, and that works uh, well. But here, unlike Hongo Mando, we can do a non local measurement. And so this is an experiment. Our signal and idler shown by these blue and red balls or photons, if you will. First, ball shaper sends them in different directions. Uh, now we have separate phase modulators, we have pulse shapers. We detect, and then we, again, we have to compare, uh, look for coincidences. So we've done this with the ley line recently. I'm not showing the data here. We've done it with uh, like a one and a half microsecond uh, delay. Uh, here is just a small delay. And then we change the delay, and we look at what happens. Where did it go? Oh, it's up here, right? So here again, it's uh, about the same resolution. We pushed it a little bit hard here. And so we think it's possible the right conditions to get down below a picosecond uh, type of uh, resolution. And in geometries like this, it's really something unique, at least, you know, with pure quantum light. And uh, we're quite interested in the opportunities for uh, contributing to synchronism in entanglement distribution networks. So uh, I've kind of uh, got to the end here. And so just to summarize, uh, or some of the things we're interested in going forward, we're clearly interested in gaining, uh, increasing our capability to certify entanglement and manipulate it in higher dimensions. Uh, you know, we're in our group, we have a lot of activities that are aimed at uh, you know, somehow using these sort of things for tasks that might be interesting in uh, quantum entanglement distribution networks. Uh, some work I didn't discuss with, uh, discuss with my colleagues, Professor Kais in chemistry, who's interested in quantum computing for, for uh, chemistry purposes. We're looking at high dimensional phase estimation algorithms. Um, this is still in its infancy, but with my colleague, Professor Chin, with uh, at this point uh, a couple different external partners as well. We're trying to figure out how to do these operations in integrated photonics. Uh, our current view is it probably won't be quite with the materials shown here, but you can certainly think of advances in uh, thin film lithium niobate for low loss on chip phase modulators. There's been work by us and others on using arrays of ring resonators uh, to essentially make on chip pulse shapers. And so, this is an area that we're you know, trying to make some progress in as well. So, again, let me conclude. Uh, Lee, again, thanks for the uh, invitation. Uh, you know, thanks uh, for everybody who watched. And again, I'd like to, uh, this is, I guess we didn't get a car with COVID. We didn't get uh, this year's new photo. I think this one might be one year old. But my uh, current and recent students who have, uh, you know, uh, contributed and really uh, done all this very nice work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you guys have time and have any questions, I'd be happy to, you know, field a few questions uh, at your pleasure. Yes, uh, we're open for questions, and uh, please uh, type in the chat if you have questions. And okay. we'll be uh, we'll be monitoring that. Okay, if there are any, Lee, I'll let you monitor that because I always have to figure out where they are on the <laughs> screen when yeah. I to read it. Yeah, don't don't worry. We'll we'll uh, if uh, if there's a comment, we'll we'll, we'll read it out uh, to you. Um, uh, Andy, maybe I can, uh, you know, while, while people are thinking about their uh, questions and typing it in, maybe I could ask a quick question. Um, there's a, a lot of a, a big body of development here using using frequency, and I certainly think it's, there's a lot of potential here, and you gave some examples. Um, so I can see a lot of applications in terms of, uh, you know, the quantum delay metrology, um, the, the, the frequency entanglement information. I'm, I'm just wondering about the, the application for, uh, for, for, for quantum walk. Um, can, you, can you comment on that uh, in terms yeah. of practically? <laughs> yeah, sure. In terms of quantum walk, so there's two aspects to that. Um, part of I admit it's uh, for uh, fun. You know that should be part of what we do, and uh, particularly some of the uh, uh, students were interested in just pushing the phase modulators and looking at quantum walk ideas. Um, 
it took a little while for me to become similarly enthused actually, but uh, I have, uh, you know, do think it's kind of cool. Practically, um, it's kind of a question. There's certainly a number of works out there uh, trying to use quantum walks uh, if they could be developed. So one of the classes of quantum computing is not just gate-based computing uh, or cluster state, but there's a class that sort of involves quantum walks and uh, sort of mapping the sort of various graph problems like something called graph isomorph isomorphism mm -hmm. into sort of quantum walk problems. My understanding is in general that uh, is going to require walking not just along one coordinate, if you will, in frequency, but another one. And so it might be frequency time, or there's some ideas if it's one coordinate frequency, you could call it sort of a synthetic dimension where maybe there's different spacings of frequency that somehow form a different sublattice. Um, whether we can really, you know, find a way to add the extra kind of control knobs or dimensions that you need to make it potentially useful there, uh, I don't know at this point. You know, I think there may be some possibilities, but from the practical point of view, you know, I would say uh, maybe, and we really haven't uh, pushed it beyond hard beyond what I showed. Uh, but possibly there's some impact, you know, within this uh, area of doing quantum walk type of processing. Okay. If there happen to be okay. any experts out there in Toronto with ideas uh, and would like to discuss with us, we'd of course uh, be delighted. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so there's actually a follow-up question from uh, from Amr, Amr, Professor Amr Helmi. Uh, he says, how does the random, war, uh, random walk work further the work by Aaron and team? So uh, Amr, glad I see you're on there. I'm glad you're uh, tuned in. Thank you. It's, uh, I, I meant, th thank you, Andy. Sorry, I'm sorry, Lee. I, I meant Yaron Silberberg, not oh. Aaron. Oh, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> that was a typo. I, I, I was going to ask about, about that. So, um, well, the second part is, uh, so your own, uh, uh, you know, our friend, uh, your own Silverberg uh, was responsible for many of fascinating things. And I, I know one of the areas in quantum walks, I know he was involved in uh, spatial quantum walks. Some of this, I think, uh, your colleague Stuart Aitchison and my former one from many years ago, uh, has all, you know, was also involved in, but looking at, for example, arrays of uh, coupled waveguides uh, sort of on a chip, yeah. sending light in and looking at some of the walk phenomena. There may have been other examples, but that's the one I'm, I'm familiar with. And so, uh, you know, to a large extent, if I think of, uh, you know, sort of the, let me actually just go back quickly to a picture. Um, yeah, here, okay. Um, yeah, so maybe this thing at the bottom left is the type of structure, uh, at least that comes to mind immediately that uh, your own and, and his colleagues, uh, you know, did some beautiful work on, on uh, a number of years ago. So here in a sense, you know, the coupling is probably mostly nearest neighbor. And uh, one of the practical, you might call it a limitation, is for a given ship, you can't tune the circuit depth, meaning there's a certain length and you sort of sample the distribution of the output. In our case, you can think of this coupling, uh, which is, uh, think of this as frequencies. And the coupling happens not because the frequencies are coupled by themselves, because the, frequent, because the phase module provides a coupling. The coupling, I would say, it's kind of interesting that you can kind of get Bessel function distributions in both cases, but you might say the phase module you're simultaneously coupling many frequencies, not just nearest neighbors. And by changing the phase modulation amplitude, you can essentially control the circuit depth. So that, that's maybe a practical distinction. You know, fundamentally, I don't think it's, uh, you know, so large. Uh, you know, one of the unique things I think we've done uh, is looking at entangled photons. Uh, I don't know if your own looked at that or not. I know people like Baha Saleh have uh, been involved in others, and certainly some things with entangled photons. Yeah, I think Baha and others, uh, some of his PI colleagues <laughs> have done some of that, uh, where they actually have taken an array, built up upon what Stewart and Yaron did, and built up an array and started to see random walks in, in, with, with entangled photons. But I don't think they've taken it as far as you guys. That's why I was just um, curious. 
Yeah, yeah, I think the kind of the, what I see as the main novelty of what we've been able to uncover uh, so far is really the, is this bit here. Uh, yeah, these, are, yeah. these are not the only examples, but essentially exercising uh, programmable current control yeah. in some sense by playing with the phase functions. And then I think also the uh, recognition that we can intuitively explain this through the essentially the Fourier basis by looking at some of the time domain pictures, you know, I think certainly helped us get some insight into what's going, uh, uh, going on. So thanks, Albert. Pleasure. No, thank you. Thank you. We have another question from Calvin. Um, I'll just read it out there. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, Professor Weiner. You mentioned how you confirm the frequency bin entanglement for 2D and 3D frequency entanglement. However, you didn't confirm the entanglement for the high dimensional case of quantum walks. <laughs> Could you use the same method as you did in low dimensions to characterize high dimensional frequency entanglement? Yeah, uh, good. So thank you. And uh, Calvin, you must be a student because you wouldn't have uh, called me professor otherwise. But anyway, thank you for your uh, uh, question. Yeah, so the uh, method that we used before in principle can work for higher dimensionality. When we originally did the experiments, so we could just barely get enough signal partly because uh, we didn't have state-of-the-art detectors, partly because you know, even at uh, 50 gigahertz line spacing, we didn't have the high bandwidth phase modulus could uh, directly connect them. So we had to use higher order RF sidebands. There's lots of places we take losses. And uh, if you try to do more frequencies at once and span a larger frequency space, those issues get more serious. So practically, we were limited at two to three dimensions. In fact, uh, even at three dimensions, we had to do a, a similar measurements, but a slightly different approach because it was too hard to get the quantum interference for the microns. The INS, INSR, INSRS group of Morandati at the same time went up to four dimensions. Uh, they were blessed with better detectors at first and, and perhaps uh, some better insight in how to do the tomography as well. But, but still, uh, that I'm sure was also quite challenging. So uh, certainly we have better detectors now, we have better phase modulators. Uh, you know, so I think going a little bit in dimensionality is certainly within reach. One of the problems that's a general problem, not just for this you know, frequency bin, not just for photons, is you go to uh, you know, higher dimensions for photons or more qubits for matter, and you want to do full quantum state tomography, the number of uh, measurements required to do sort of the full state characterization or reconstruction grows very fast and it becomes unwieldy. And so, you know, for that reason, you know, even if we can push the dimensionality a little bit, you know, I think eight or 10 is probably a huge stretch. There's a lot of techniques trying to do it more efficiently. And one that we've been exploring and we have a clear submission on this is uh, essentially to do a series of random measurements and uh, that kind of span the states. And then uh, somehow to uh, use that, uh, in our case, we do Bayesian estimation, a technique our collaborators at Oak Ridge have really uh, helped advance to reconstruct the quantum state. And uh, in our case, the phase modulator doesn't give us fully random measurements, but we can randomly change the phase modulation amplitude while we randomly change the pulse shape or phase settings. And uh, uh, my recently graduated student, you know, Peach Lu, really. Uh, showed through simulation that could work. You know, so far we've done things up to five dimensions by, with the uh, SPDC sources. We're uh, trying it now with some of the microring sources and hope to push it a little bit higher than that. Uh, simulation suggests we might be okay, but it's in progress and we'll see what we can really carry out experimentally. So they're kind of similar techniques, but uh, trying to essentially do a more uh, efficient measurement set together with some uh, more advanced estimation techniques to try to uh, more efficiently reconstruct the quantum state. So that's probably a longer answer than you wanted, but you know, I think it's a, a very interesting direction. It's challenging and you know, we think we're kind of on the cusp of making, making some progress. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, indeed, this is also a question that we are uh, uh, struggling with, with high dimension. Um, so we're looking at some 
uh, witness-based uh, approach um, to look at in high dimension entanglement, uh, as well as entropy measure type of mm -hmm. approach. And maybe that would be more experimentally feasible uh, to wasn't do. The, Lee, wasn't the, the paper by Roberto and, um, and Bill Monroe, they used witness, right? Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, so you, you could um, uh, try to, I think tra there's a trade-off uh, between the, the noise tolerance and the number of measurements. Um, yeah, the setup is much more complicated, like the setup is a lot more uh, elaborate, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But, but still, I think uh, they were still talking about, I don't know, 80 some or, or in the hundreds of, of measurements for a, a dimension of four, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's still fairly large. Yeah, I, think I, I certainly read that and they had some beautiful uh, measurements and it's impressively uh, large mm -hmm. and therefore it must have been challenging, you know, set of measurements to make that happen. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, it, uh, does, it, it does help that everything there was in fiber. Like some of what we do involves coupling into chips and stuff and we can't even begin to think about the stability requirements for us to have a witness um, I mean, we don't work in cluster or high dimension states, but but um, but even once you go beyond two, uh, like having working with chips rather than actually with fibers and things becomes daunting. Just to, just if nothing else, just the stability standpoint. Mm. Well, I hope uh, Lee and Amr, we both have some time. Uh, yes, but it. <laughs> A little bit more when the time comes. Yeah, definitely. I think we should uh, we should discuss uh, uh, later <laughs> rather than using using this time. Um, but I actually don't see uh, any additional questions. But we are actually uh, way out of uh, <laughs> uh, over over time here. Um, so then, thank you very much, and uh, we we will have individual meetings uh, with you later. Um, after your lunch, I'm sorry for taking uh, taking up time for your lunch, and uh, for for the other audience, uh, thank you uh, everybody for participating in our seminar series. Uh, the talk has been recorded and will be made available online. Now, if you enjoy this talk, sign up uh, for our mailing list or or go to our website oh, photonics.utoronto.ca and uh, check for future events. So until next time, uh, see you and please uh, log off. Uh